Hey Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with a video that could save you thousands of dollars, even tens of thousands of dollars, but only if you watch it right now. Too many people wait until April to think about their taxes, but for investors, now at the end of the year is the most important time to understand this and the strategies I'm about to show you to avoid paying more capital gains tax than you should. Folks, I know it's not as sexy as talking about the next hot stock to buy, but this, this right here is the single most important part of investing. Most investors just don't realize that. When I worked private wealth management, now helping our clients avoid capital gains taxes, stealing their hard-earned dollars, that was the number one way we provided value. I've shared on the channel before how with just one client, we helped avoid $1.5 million in taxes with some of these strategies that I'm going to reveal. And these are going to work whether you're investing $100 or $100 million in your portfolio. We'll get to those tax tips next. But if you want to stay up to date with the stock market, I want to personally invite you to get the weekly bow tie, our free weekly newsletter with all the stock market news, strategies, and trends you need to see. Each week before the market opens, I'll show you what I'm watching and the stocks that could highlight the week. It's all totally free, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community. So look for that link below. Back to those tax tips to avoid capital gains though, and I wanna start with a quick recap of what capital gains taxes are, how they work, and some important details that a lot of investors mix. Nation, I know a lot of you are savvy investors already. Even if you know what capital gains taxes are, put the video on 2X speed at this point, listen through because these are the details here that even experienced investors can learn from. Now the idea of capital gains tax is easy, right? When you sell a stock for more than you bought it for. So say you bought it for $100, you sell it for a 200, that's $100 in profit. That is your capital gains. You made money. That's capital gains. And anyone that has ever made money knows when you make money, all your friends and family come out to congratulate you and share in your windfall. And that includes your good old Uncle Sam. But your Uncle Sam isn't going to ask nicely. He's just going to take a chunk of those profits. In fact, he's going to tell you up front how much he's going to take. Here we see the capital gains tax tax rates by income level, and I've tried to match these up to compare them with income tax rates at each level. We're going to get into more detail in this later, but you can see if you make under $44,625 as an individual or under about $89,000 married, then Uncle Sam is going to have mercy on you and let you keep all those profits. You pay zero capital gains tax if you report income under these levels. If you make more than that, that's when your good old uncle comes begging. He's going to take 15% of your profits, so 15% capital gains tax if you make between eighty. Nine thousand and five hundred fifty thousand income as a married couple. It's going to take 20% of your profits if your income is higher than that. And unlike the rest of your family that has to learn about your new money through gossip, Uncle Sam has a far sneakier way. He's going to make your broker and your investing platform tell him about it. Each year, you're going to get a 1099 form from the investing site you use. I'm going to walk you through my E-Trade form here, one of the five investing sites I use for stocks, but these are all going to be the same. And if you want to know, I'll share links to all the other investing sites I use in the description below. And this 1099 is going to be broken down into two sections, that 1099 DIV, which is going to show you your dividends you collected. And then the 1099B is going to show the gains and losses on your investments, your capital gains. Is. Now those gains and losses on your stocks are also going to be broken down into short term and long term, depending on how long you held that investments. And this is going to be hugely important for the capital gains taxes you pay. You see any stock you buy and sell within 365 days. So if you own a stock for less than a year before you sell it, any profit you make is going to be added to your income and taxed at your income tax rate. It is a short-term capital gains. It is going to be taxed as income. Now looking back on those tax rates and you see what a giant difference this makes. Even if you make less than $44,000 in income for the year, you're still paying income taxes. If those short-term profits are added to your income, you're losing at least 10 or 12% of those profits to Uncle Sam. If you could have held on to that investment for longer than 365 days, though, it would have been a long-term capital gains and taxed at those lower rates that we see here on the right. Back to the form here. And each year, you're going to receive this 1099 from your broker. It's first going to categorize all your short-term and long-term investments, adding up all the profits and losses on your investments in each category, which ones you held short-term, which ones you've held long-term. You can see here, though, even with a lot of planning, sometimes you just can't avoid those short-term gains. I made 36% on my AMC trade last month and 81% on a short dollar bet that we shared here on the channel. And I'm going to owe taxes on that come tax time. I don't usually report much in long-term gains because I hold my long-term stocks for years. But next, I'm going to show you ways to use both of these to avoid capital gains tax as well as higher income tax. Now, that 1099 is also going to show you the detail on each investment you bought and sold. So the detail behind those summarized numbers. But Trusting these numbers is one of the biggest tax mistakes investors make, and I'm going to explain that next. Here, the 1099 is also going to include all the dividends you collected in that 1099-DIV form. 
No, all you out there in the nation know, I love me some dividend stocks, but you don't see them here. I collect several thousand dollars a month in dividends, but the difference in what you see here is another of the tax tricks most investors miss that I'm gonna explain. Finally though, before we get to those mistakes and the tax tricks that are gonna help you avoid those capital gains taxes, your 1099 is gonna show you all the margin interest you paid. I don't use margin that much, so this isn't usually a big number for me, but another one of those savings that most investors miss when it comes to saving on taxes. Okay, I know we're having so much fun talking tax basics, but I'm gonna have to burst your bubble. You're probably paying way too much in capital gains tax than you should. That's because nearly every investor makes at least one of these four tax mistakes or misses one of these five opportunities that I'm gonna show you here. And tax mistake number one is not understanding that writing options for income is taxed as income. This is a big one, not only for options investors, but for a lot of you out there investing in those income ETFs like the NASDAQ 100 covered call ETF, the QILD. Yeah, that 12% dividend sounds great, but investors don't realize even if you hold the stock for more than a year, that dividend cash flow is taxed as income. And remember, paying income taxes rather than those long-term capital gains tax rates is exactly what you do not want to do. I'm gonna walk you through why this happens. So understand anytime you sell an option, so you sell a call or a put option and collect that premium, collect that cash, if you close out the position before expiration or if the option expires worthless and you keep that premium, the money you collected is added to your income for taxes. And because this is what those monthly income ETFs like the QYLD do to generate that income, they sell those options and collect the cash. Whether you've hold the ETF for days or years or whenever, that dividend income will always be taxed as regular income at those higher rates. And the only way around this, if you're selling options directly, is to have the option exercised and then hold that stock for longer than a year. You see that in the middle column here and how short options are taxed. If you sell a covered call, so you own the stock, you sell a call against that, collect some cash, then you do it on the stocks that you've held more than a year. So the sale of the stock is going to be taxed on those lower, longer, lower longer term capital gains. And I know a lot of you still love those income ETFs. It doesn't mean that you can't invest in these. Just know that the after-tax dividend yield is gonna be much lower than you think. For example, for someone in the 32% income tax bracket, this 12.3% dividend on the QYLD is really only 8.4% after income taxes. Another tax mistake I see a lot of investors make is just not accounting for the difference in short-term and long-term rates. I'm just as bad about this as anybody, but investors jump in and out of stocks and make they think they're doing great, but is that short-term profit really worth, really high enough to give Uncle Sam another 10 to 15% of the profit? For example, my wife and I are here in the 35% income tax bracket, paying 20% more on short-term investments that in that income tax rate than the capital gains tax rate of 15% on longer-term investments. Now, I know that makes the $277,000 I booked in short-term gains look ridiculously stupid on my part, paying over $50,000 more in taxes, but sometimes you just can't avoid it. When you have a good short-term trade, you have to go with it and taxes be damned. But when in doubt, always try to invest for those long-term capital gains rates. Uh, that's going to mean strategies where you plan on holding the stock or the option for at least a year. Here's an easy tax mistake that is going to save you a lot of money. Remembering to deduct the margin interest you paid. That margin interest paid can be deducted from your capital gains and your broker statement is going to show you how much you paid. Now this you're going to add as a deduction called investment interest expense on form 4952 for your taxes and it's going to lower the amount of profit you took in. Final tax mistake I see most investors make, and we'll get to those five tax tips, but you must check the numbers on your 1099 broker statement. Folks, these statements are going to list out your cost basis and proceeds on each sold investment, and they're pretty accurate, but they are not infallible. For example, if you bought a stock at different times and then only sell some, the broker might be using a first in first out system where it's going to take that lower cost stock that you bought first, sell that, and that's going to mean higher taxes. Beyond this accounting difference, sometimes this, this 1099 is just plain wrong. I had a $10,000 difference once in a 1099 that said an actual gain on the stock. If, it had, if I hadn't kept a spreadsheet of all my stocks, it would have cost me an additional $1,500 in capital gains taxes that I didn't need to pay. Nation, I know this is a lot of work, learning all this stuff, keeping track of it on a spreadsheet, but if you think about it on a per hour basis, this is the best money you'll ever make. You can do all of this easily on less than 10 hours a year, maybe an hour each month keeping track of your stocks and the taxes you might be owing. If it saves you even $1,000 a year in taxes, 
that's like making $100 an hour. And most of you is gonna save even more than that, more like $10,000 on your taxes. That's because besides those tax mistakes I see investors make, there's also five tax tips that I'm gonna share with you now that are gonna help you avoid paying too much in capital gains taxes. First here is to keep your cash flow investments in retirement accounts. Remember when we saw I collected less than $5,000 in dividends? The real number is more like five times that amount, but those dividends are in my retirement accounts, my 401k, my IRAs, and my Roth accounts. You do not pay taxes on your dividends every year in a retirement account like you do in a regular taxable account. All that cash flow gets to stay in your account and keep making money for you. Folks, this is so important. Look at how much you lose over 26 years investing in Coca-Cola. Even at the long-term qualified dividends tax rate of 15%, the taxes you pay on dividends every year for stocks you hold for longer than a year, you lose almost $50,000 in taxes if it's in a regular taxable account. Now, of course, you're limited to how much you can put in your retirement accounts each year, but prioritize those for high dividend stocks. Okay, high cash flow investments for those accounts gonna save you thousands in taxes. Another tip, be more strategic with your tax loss harvesting. I know nobody likes selling stocks at a loss, but it can actually be a very smart tool to lower your taxes. You notice in my tax form, even though I reported profits on both short-term and long-term investments, not everything was rainbows and unicorns. I took a $5,000 loss on some S&P 500 put options and a $12,000 loss on shares of TU Inc. So when you take a loss on investment, when you sell a stock for less than you bought it for, it cancels out some of that equal amount of gains that loss does. This means you could potentially book all your profits on your investments and without paying any taxes if you also had some losses that you can take to offset those. Even better here, if your losses exceed your profits in any one year, you can take up to $3,000 off your income and avoid paying more income taxes as well. Again, nobody likes selling stocks at a loss. Nobody likes taking that loss, but there is a strategy here where you can still get the upside in that stock, erase that loss, but use the losses to offset your profits. Now, if you sell a stock and use the loss to offset profits, you're not allowed to buy that same stock back within 30 days. It's called the wash sale rule. It's a major no-no for taxes. I put the SEC tax work here up on the screen but a workaround in this to keep you in that potential upside for that stock what you can do is buy another stock that moves very closely with this one a one that you can hold for 30 days and still get the upside before you buy back into that old stock that you sold at a loss for example say you bought at the recent $300 high in shares of Tesla for hundred shares you're now sitting at a loss of more than six thousand dollars you like the stock long term you want to write it back up but that loss can go to offset some of your profits in other investments what you can do is after selling those shares of Tesla taking that money, you can put that money in something like maybe the ARCQ, the Autonomous Tech ETF, which we can see here follows the returns on Tesla very closely mostly because Tesla makes up 13% of the fund. So you sell your shares of Tesla, you use that $6,000 loss to offset profits and other investments and to pay no taxes. You buy the same amount then with the whatever you got from those sold shares of Tesla. You buy that same amount for the ARC Q and hold it for the next 30 days where it should keep up to pace with the returns on shares of Tesla. Then in 31 days, you can go back, you sell your ARC Q shares, put that money back in Tesla and write it up over the long term. Next, charitable deductions are another often missed way to avoid capital gains tax. And it took me a long time to see the full reasoning behind this. I always figured, you know, yeah, I'm paying less in capital gains taxes, but I'm also losing that money that I donated. So how is this better? There is more than meets the eye here though. When you donate a, st when you donate a stock to a qualified charity, first, you don't have to pay any taxes on the capital gains that you would have had to pay in that stock. If you had sold the stock, booked the profit, you would have had huge tax capital gains taxes. For those of you in the higher tax brackets, you might owe 20% or more in their profit in taxes. Also though, and here's where you're going to see more benefit, you can take that entire amount you donated off your income taxes. An example here will make it a lot clearer. Let's say you bought those 3,000 shares of Tesla back in 2019 for just under $15 each. And congrats, by the way. Now those shares are worth $235 and you're sitting on more than $660,000 in capital gains. So now if you sold that stock and you're in that 15% capital gains tax bracket, you would owe a tax bill of $99,000 on that profit. And for the example, let's say you're in the 24% income tax bracket and you've got taxable income that year of $220,000. You're looking at taxes of almost $40,000 on your regular income. That's a total tax bill of $140,000 if you sell your Tesla stock at this point. But listen to this. What if you donated $100,000 of that stock to a charity? 
that's about 425 shares at that $235 price. You would still owe $84,000 in capital gains. That's down from $99,000 in capital gains taxes. You're not going to avoid all of it because that was a huge profit. It's about $705,000 in shares of Tesla minus your cost basis of $45,000. So you donated the $100,000. You've still got $705,000 in Tesla shares minus whatever you paid in it. That's gonna, and then at that times that 15% capital gains tax rate, that's gonna leave you with a tax bill, capital gains tax bill of about $84,000. Now you've cut your capital gains taxes by 15%, $15,000 already, you know, down from 99,000. Plus, here's where it works, plus you would lower your taxable income by $100,000. So that $100,000 you donated to charity from your Tesla stock, you lower your income by that amount. You would lower your income tax bill by $22,600. You've lowered your ta total taxes by $38,000 uh, on that 425 shares initially, and it only cost you $6,000 in those initial shares. Those 425 shares that you bought at $15 each way back when, it's only cost you $6,000. They're now saving you $38,000 in taxes. I know it's a lot of numbers to throw at you, but can be a great way to save tens of thousands of dollars in taxes, give up relatively little, and be a hero to a lot of people. Now, this next tax tip is an easy one, but so often neglected, maxing out your 401k and IRA contributions. Did you know more than four in 10 workers with a 401k at work don't contribute to it? It is something that blew my mind when I was working a nine to five, that everyone in the office didn't fully contribute to their company match. Nation, that company match on your 401k plan is free money, and I guarantee it's the best investment you will ever make. If your company matches your 401k contributions, even a 50% match, that's up to save $6,000, that's still an instant 50% return. Nobody gets a 50% return. Not Warren Buffett, not Peter Lynch, not even your bow tie buddy here, not even close. So whatever your company matches, most companies will match up to about 3% of your salary. They'll either match fully 100% or they'll match 50% of that, but contribute at least that much to get that full match. You're gonna save on your income taxes because you can deduct that money off your income Plus, you're going to get an instant return on that match. I've saved one of the best for last. One of the most often benefits of investing in treasury bills and municipal bills. A treasury bill is just a bond issued by the U.S. government. Right now, you're getting rates above 5% on treasuries, and you pay no state or local taxes on the interest. That can be huge tax savings in states like California with higher state tax rates. It's not much help in here, here in Florida where we don't have an income tax rate, but we still have those municipal bonds. Uh, these bonds are issued by state and local governments, and, and the interest here is not only exempt from federal income taxes, but also state and local. These are going to make more sense for the higher tax brackets and in those states with the higher income tax rate. For example, you can find a double A rated high quality municipal bond in California that pays 5.6% a year, but your actual after tax return is much higher. Now, these municipal bonds are backed by state and local governments, revenue from special projects or infrastructure. And the highly rated ones like the triple A or the double A have default rates that are almost non-existent. Since the 70s, less than one in 5,000 AA rated muni bonds have defaulted. Now to compare a municipal bond interest rate against an ordinary investment, especially taxable bonds, you just divide the muni bond yield by one minus your tax rate. I'll walk you through this one. There are calculators online that make this easy and you can see how great these investments can be. Someone living in California with 220,000 in taxable income would pay 9.3% state income tax on top of their 24% federal income tax rate. Not having to pay state or federal taxes on that municipal bond interest is like getting a taxable investment with an 8.6% interest rate. Now that's better than the return on some stocks and you get it with safe investment grade municipal bonds. It's part of the market that most investors just don't know about, but like all these tax tips, spend just a few hours learning these and you're going to save thousands of dollars in your capital gains taxes. Stay up to date with all the market trends, strategies, and the stocks to watch with the link to the Bowtie Weekly in the video description below. Or click on the video to the right for the seven monthly dividend stocks that will pay your rent, the average rent by state, and the stocks that will pay it for you. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.